Well, nice to uh, to meet all of you online and have this uh, opportunity. And uh, well, I prepared some uh, some slides regarding our background and, and approach. And uh, bef because we work mainly with offline tools, I think it might be a little bit different from the approach that many people have to, to serious games. And I'm going to especially focus on how we use uh, gamification in games to to help large organizations to work with different aspects of, of strategy. Uh, well, first, I'd just like to, to, to share this uh, interesting quote from, uh, from uh, Prussia. And, and, that's, uh, and the Prussian tradition of war games is, is a key inspiration from, for, for me and also for what we do at, at Works. Well, first, a little bit of background. And um, I think I'm going to cover this very fast. Uh, but basically, my name is, is Ask Aga, and uh, I'm from Denmark. And it's like on the, on the top part of, of, of Europe, on the back of Germany. And I think we're mainly known for like this, the Little Mermaid, or we like to bike a lot also when it's snowing. But, uh, but I think the, 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 the latest years is also very much about our, our drama stories with strong female leads. And of course, we are famous for Lego all over the world. And uh, I'm originally from Aarhus, which is like the second largest town in, in, in Denmark. I used to train uh, Filipino martial arts and study political science. And uh, well, probably it was heading like for a career in as a public servant or, or perhaps a, a researcher. And uh, I moved to Copenhagen, Copenhagen uh, the capital of Denmark back in 97, and was about to finalize my final thesis and get a job that my parents could understand. But then I was approached by um, my parents back in, in Aarhus. But then I was approached by this movie company called Centroba. And they didn't approach me because they need to know about uh, political science or about martial arts, but because I've been playing games since I was a small kid, working with role playing games and board games and, and have been designing some games. And at that point, there was like a director called Lars von Trier that was working on some projects. And he, did, he needed help from people who knew about game design and interactive storytelling. So, so this is how my career started within game development and so forth. And uh, I was, uh, became a part of Centroba, uh, the movie company, and, uh, and was heading two different departments, one Centroba in Saxon and the other Centroba Works, and, and, and had this great opportunity to both work within the movie industry as a script consultant and in other functions, but also to work with, with games involvement and storytelling in, in, for different corporate clients. This is where, where it all started, uh, started for me back then. And um, then came the financial crisis. And, uh, and, and just before it, it hit Denmark really hard, uh, we split up from Centrova and formed a company called Works, which is uh, the company that I'm heading right now. And uh, we're located in the heart of Copenhagen. This is the lookout of our company windows, uh, where yeah, a few months ago when it was still winter in, in, in Copenhagen. And we are a little bit more than 20 people on the staff and a good mix of different kind of backgrounds along the way. Very diverse group. And our, the, our key point is to work with involvement um, from like a basic understanding that, that, that most people like change, but nobody likes to be changed. So if the change is something that is forced upon us, if we're just a passive victim to the process, well, there is a lot of resistance and not, not much ownership. So this is what we work with a lot. And our, our key opponents are to, to help them transform, not ending up like the, the dodo and getting in, being extinct. And uh, our approach is very much using games. And uh, we have an emphasis on, on physical games. We see games as uh, talking pieces, a way of designing important conversations and organizations. And uh, we make a lot of bespoke solutions for specific clients, but also have a range of more generic tools. And uh, this is a, a little bit overview of the different kind of, of, uh, of generic tools that we offer. And, uh, and we have been building like a partnership network internationally for the last five years. So we have approximately like 20 partners in other countries that are using our games in different kind of markets. And uh, finally, this is my two sons, uh, Storm and, and, and Snake. And Snake is a Danish word for snow. So, so now you know everything about me. So, uh, so yeah, that was a little bit of a background. And first I'm gonna just talk a little bit about change, why to use games. And then I'm going to be more specific regarding how we use games to work with change and, and with the, especially with strategy along the way. Uh, just starting out with, with one of my favorite pictures. 
This uh, this photo is uh, I've been told from from Sweden, and it's back from the I think the late 60s. The first morning, still, uh, Sweden was changing direction on the roads. In Sweden, people were used to driving in, in the left side of the road as to do in Britain, but they, but they were changing back then to align with the rest of Europe. I think it's just amazing that that because all these uh, Swedish drivers back then, they they knew about the change. There were like campaigns and signs and so forth. But, it, but, but the picture just shows that, that we are a victim of, of our habits. So, so when you get into the car in the morning, driving to work, it's very hard to do something else that you normally do. So change is hard along the way. And, uh, and especially with working with humans and, and working against culture and behavior and traditions and so forth. But also change can be necessary. And I'm sure that Sweden is very happy today that they made the change back then. I think it would be impossible to make that transition uh, today along the way. Uh, as you all know, uh, big organizations are living a dangerous life today. I think that John Cottle, the old godfather of change management, he, back in 95, in his, uh, in his book, uh, Leading Change, he estimated that like only 30% of change projects were successful. And, and according to the research that I know about, the, the odds are, st are still very much the same. And you can even say that there is a, an, an acceleration regarding like the mortality of, of big companies. And this paragraph just shows the, 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 the top 500 companies in America and how long they've been able to like stay on, 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 on that list uh, looking back at when it all started. And if we put in like a, we can call like a, like a half time, you can see that if you look at the list back in, in, in 55, well, the, the half time, the, the number of years that, that went by before half of these companies had dropped out of Back then was like 25 years. But if you look at the green line, which is like the latest list, uh, starting in 95, you can see now the half time is, is, has fallen to 12 years. So you might say that the big companies are only surviving for half as long time as they used to do. So change is hard. It's very hard to keep up along the way. And, and of course, there's many, many reasons. Uh, there's a lot of studies looking into this, and, uh, and I think that the, the key point in many of these is that we overlook all the software aspects of change. And, 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 and this data is from a global study uh, by IBM. And what they, they asked a lot of different kind of, of, of change leaders, what is, what is most important for success? And what is, I think is interesting is that it's mainly like the soft factors. Of course, top management sponsorship is very important, but employee involvement is number two. And then it's all about culture, it's about communication and so forth. And if you look at the traditional like strong factors, hard factors, regarding uh, KPIs, structure, incentives, training, they're way down the list. And I think it's not about you know, one or the, or, or the other, but I think this, this study emphasizes that we have a tendency to overlook the, the software aspects of change. And I think that's an aspect where, uh, where games can make an important difference. We are inspired by the American psychologist Rick Maurer, who's written a very nice book regarding uh, breaking the wall of resistance. And he's working on he, he's working on like three different levels of resistance. Because there's different reasons why people don't want to be part of the change process. Uh, and, and level one is about communications. I don't understand it. So so the change might be uh, hard to understand, might be very complicated and so forth. So that, that can be a reason why people would like to say fall off the bus. Then we have the second level. The second level is where people say, well, now I understand it and I don't like it. Uh, I can't see the reason for it. And this is, this is like re resistance on a more emotional level. I feel isolated. I'm feeling afraid. I'm afraid of losing the things that I appreciate in the organization and the current positions and so forth. And finally, the third level, which is the, the most dangerous understand it. They might also like it, but they don't trust the leader. There's a basic mistrust conversation. It's very, very hard to, to build efficient change. Um, and I think one of the key aspects in my experience why, why change is difficult, in, in especially in big organizations, is that, that all managers have a tendency to, to understand resistance or lack of, of support as, as uh, number one. They think it's all about communication. And they try to solve most problems by just communicating even more. 
But I think in in in, in I think it. Uh, I ask you need to turn. Make sure that you're in the mic. They're hearing some background noise, and your audio is low. Okay, I, but I think there is no background noise right here. I think it. Yeah, but I think it, I'm not sure it's for me, but I'll, okay. I'll try to. So, so basically, I think that that there is a tendency to view all kind of persistence at level one. Uh, and try to treat it with just more communication. And I think that's a that's a great mistake because many times the resistance is, is emotion on level two, or it's about trust on level three. And to address these these aspects of um, regarding these aspects of resistance, it's not enough to communicate. You have to go into dialogue. You have to listen. You have to discuss, understand, and so forth. And I think that, that that's a key aspect that tends to be overlooked in big organizations. And I think to that kind of involvement, I think uh, games offer a, a, a great tool to, to facilitate those kind of processes along the way. For me, it's, it's a little bit amazing that, that when you want to be professional in sports, if there is something like very important, you're playing for the finals or there's a very important match, well, what do you do as a professional? Well, normally you try to pick out the team beforehand and you do a lot of training. So, and you make sure that, that you leave all the basic mistakes on the training court before it really counts. So you play test matches. You try to, 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 to test and try out and refine special kind of moves and so forth. And, and, and that's what you do in sports. But what I think is very amazing that when you then compare it to big organizations, in my, in my experience, that there is a, isn't a lot of preparations. In many cases, even in very big organizations, people don't just show up on game day. And, uh, and, and, and that's like, it, it's only, it's on the game day for the big match that you put the team together and then you start to, to, to try to deliver high performance. And of course, uh, and that kind of, of, of um, uh, and that kind of a background, you make a lot of rookie mistakes, unnecessary rookie mistakes when you, when you, try, when you start out. And I think that that's an aspect where game offer a very unique and great opportunity to, to, to simulate the process, to try it out beforehand, to have a training ground where you can get the team together, you can refine what you're doing, you can get alignment along the way, and you can make sure that you are on, at, your, at your peak of performance before it really counts. So with many of our big clients, this is what we try to do. We try to help them to make sure that they have at, as good odds as possible to deliver regarding the change projects they're working with along the way. And the key part is to train before it really goes on. And, and to use games as an opportunity to make mistakes where you only are playing a price in monopoly money, game pieces, instead of real budgets, real clients, real, real colleagues, and so forth. So, so that is why we like to use games and simulations. And we do a lot of work as consultants. So, so we, we don't use games in all our projects, but but when it fits in, we, we try to work with these aspects. And the whole tradition about working with, with games and simulations in, 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 in leadership and in strategy is, uh, is, uh, is very ancient. Uh, so I'm just going to look a little bit back in history to, uh, to just to present a little bit of the background. And this is a part I could talk a lot about, but I'll try to do it, uh, do it fairly fast. Uh, you might even say that, that using games to train leadership is where it all started. So it's way older than PowerPoints or traditional presentations. And, uh, and, and uh, if you go back to Mesopotamia, the current Iraq, well, there is, there is games that is uh, from ancient times. It's from, uh, and one of them is the King Game of Ur. These games go back perhaps even 10,000 years. So, so you might say that even for the young princes uh, from the start of civilizations have been using games to train leadership, to train strategy along the way. And uh, if, we, if we work away from the Middle East, we can go, for instance, to India. Uh, and of course, we all know chess today, but, but chess has a lot of historical um, variations and, 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 and ancient families. Uh, one is, uh, I'm not sure about my pronunciation in Sanskrit. It's not very good. But I think it's called like Shaturanga. It's like an Indian game. And, and basically a game about cheating about, you know, battlefield maneuvers, uh, basic tactics and so on. 
but uses by by uh, by princes and so to to train their their skills on uh, on, on the battlefield. Personal uh, favorite of of mine is uh, Lee Hess, uh, which is, was a game from uh, from uh, year 900 from China, and this, this was a very specific game, a training game that was helping people who were like applying for a test to be a civil servant. And it was like a very important exam, and and uh, he developed like a training game that would help people to pass this exam. This kind of game design was inspired by the tradition of, of what's called like snake and ladders. So it was very much a game helping people to understand what kind of, of behavior is, is correct and leading in the right direction and what kind of behavior you should avoid along the way. So it's very much about direction setting, giving instructions and so forth. And there's many variations of these different kind of games from, from all over Asia and the Middle East and so forth, also to Egypt. But, but I think this is like the tradition we're working with. And, uh, and it's nothing new. It's, you might say it's, it's where it all started back then. And just a final example is from the Kriegspiel of Prussia, which uh, inspires, uh, is very inspiring for us. And, uh, and there's many different variations, and, and many of the Danish kings were also very fond of these games, which were like the, the trend and hype of, of, of Europe back then. But basically, the games were used to, in the time of peace, to, to, to help officers understand how to be flexible on the battlefield. And it was not about so much about being able to predict how a, 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 a military confrontation would, would evolve, but more about having what I think more modern game researchers call like a scenario, to, scenario competence, about being able to understand different scenarios, different options along the way, to be able to, in an agile way, to, to adapt to the different options on the battlefield. So very much about being able to to understand all the complexity on the battlefield and be able to to um, to adapt to probe options to to be able to look at the different outcomes and so forth. So just a little bit of background, and I'm going to look at three different aspects where games can support strategy. And the first is about when making a strategy, and this is what we normally call like market simulations or industry simulations, or also like war rooms. And then afterwards, I'm going to address a little bit about when you have a strategy, how can you use games to help to share it across the organization to create alignment? And these kind of solutions we normally call like strategy simulations. And then finally, I'm going to look a little bit at, at games also helping us to lead the transformation along the way. This is what we normally call like leadership simulations. So the first part is about making the strategy. And um, and I'm just going to start by sharing a specific case that we did earlier this year. This is about uh, about understanding Putin and what is what is uh, what, what what is going on in Russia right now. Um, last year, uh, many of our clients were very surprised about the development in Eastern Europe uh, in the relationship between the West and Russia, and also regarding the development in Ukraine. I'm, I'm sure it's the same with with many American companies. But the Russian and Eastern Europe market is very critical to many Danish companies, and, uh, and 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 nobody had like expected what was going on. Everybody thought that that having like you know big uh, battles on ground between main ba main battle tanks and artillery and so forth, it was something that we had left behind you know many many years ago. But suddenly we had like this like real warfare going on between major powers on the European continent. And that was a, like a big shock to everybody. And uh, I talked to, to a number of our different clients about these aspects, and um, and we decided to set up like a closed war room session where we could try to understand the, the, the dynamics and try to understand the Russian perspective. So we had like a, a session where we invited uh, key people from many of the biggest Danish organizations, from Carlsberg and Lego and so forth. But also we had like participants from from the foreign department and and also the the, the Danish military intelligence uh, uh, helped us as well. And what we did was that we created a session, a war game, where we tried to understand the situation as it was right now. And then we created two teams that were playing. One 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 group was playing Russia and the other was playing the West. And uh, and we had like a, a mutual briefing. We had like a setup, a big game board where we had all the military resources and so forth. 
And then during this game that we moderated, each side had some time to pick different kind of options. Uh, we had a number of options to, to, to work with, but also people could come up with, with their own. And then each turn of the game, we tried to simulate what would, what would happen in 2015. And then uh, after each session, each side could pick a number of actions. And then we tried to, to, to do our best to try to adapt the situation and see what were like the consequences. And, uh, and after each round, we had some reflections where we said, well, if this was happening in real life, how would it impact the popularity of Putin? How would it impact, uh, how would it impact the oil price? How would it impact the financial markets? How would it impact the, the business interests of, uh, of, uh, of Denmark and so forth? And it was very engaging, very interesting. And there was also a number of like unseen events and so forth in the game along the way. And the point was not trying to predict what would happen, but the point was try to have a better understanding of the dynamics along the way, what were the, like, the important tipping points we should be aware of, but also understanding like the Russian perspective along the way. What is their mindset? How do they perceive the different actions of Europe and so forth? And of course, many of the, the corporate clients had like specific interests in, in, in certain areas and certain countries and so forth. They also got a lot of interest in you know, feedback and knowledge sharing regarding these aspects. So it's just one example of us using a, a game approach, try to make a war game, try to understand understand a specific, very complicated concepts along the way. Uh, and there are some other aspects, but, but this is what I can share. We also used the war room aspect for a lot of in different sectors, a little different clients. Uh, and these illustrations is for a very old project uh, regarding the, the development within the, the telecommunication sector in Denmark. Try to look at, at the different options along the way when new technology is coming into the market, try to understand the options. And I think a key aspect that the games offer is the, uh, is the opportunity to change perspective. That you can try to play the competition, you can try to play the customer, you can try to play different kind of stakeholders along the way. And I think this is a key tool to, to uh, to have new insights, new understanding along the way. We also created wall, wall rooms uh, within like business intelligence. This is illustration of a, a, a solution we did for SAS Institute. We also did it for like the financial sector. <clears throat> we also did it within uh, within shipping uh, and, and had a very interesting project looking at, at when, when the Arab Spring was uh, starting in the Middle East. Try to look at the different kind of directions it could go, the different scenarios, how to to uh, to to understand the dynamics and, and 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 how you should how you could react along the way. So a lot of different projects, with different different uh, clients, but all helping to understand complicated situations, to to look at different perspectives, to look at different scenarios and so forth. And the final example is uh, one we did for a big client recently within the pharma industry. And they were looking at different options regarding their R&D approach and so forth. And, uh, and we tried to play out different scenarios, but also tried to, to play the competition. And what was very interesting, this aspect was that, that during this game, there was like this very great incident where one of the key players, I think he was like the, the director of, of, of sales or marketing. And suddenly he said like in the game, he said, wait, wait a minute, I think we got it all wrong. And the point was that, that there was like this, uh, one technology platform that the, that the company has uh, disregarded. And, uh, and suddenly, by playing a competitor instead, you got a whole new understanding of this technology platform. And, uh, and, 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 and as, at the same second that he said it, everybody in the room knew that he was right. So, so it was just a, a way of, of suddenly a new insight uh, coming from playing a game where changing perspective helped people to think outside the box. And to confront some of the, you know, uh, very there is in all organizations there is over time building some very, very solid, uh, a solid view of competition of market and so forth, and uh, and sometimes these uh, expectations and these uh, like pictures of the world turn out to be wrong or to be limited. And I think uh, games and, and and there was this like specific case is a, is a very great opportunity to try to. To, to, to look at different approaches and, 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 and to, um, to address some of these uh, expectations or conditions and see if, 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 the, if the reality is perhaps a little bit different, if those are other approaches. So 
so, so this is just a few examples of how we use games to, to, to help to make strategy along the way in organizations. The other aspect is that when you have a strategy, but you need to unroll it in a big organization, uh, that is always a big challenge. And uh, in, in, in many organizations, it's very easy to have a bunch of cheerleaders. So the, so the CEO might make an excellent presentation and everybody's clapping, but it's very much his strategy or her strategy. And everybody else is like, well, sounds great, go ahead and let me do my job. So, so what is key in big organizations is to make sure that everybody is aligned, but also they understand how they can contribute to the strategy, what are the expectations and so forth. So, so for many of our clients, what we do is that we help them to, to take a, a strategy, which is always very complicated, and then try to use a game format to make it tangible and to make sure that people can, can understand in, 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 uh, through involvement, well, why is the strategy right? What is it about? What's the difference between a traditional approach and how we're gonna do it moving forward and so forth? And just a few examples. One is uh, within the pharma business. Well, before a very large company created like a, a strategy game that was played by the top 300 management group. And they were looking at the development in the, in the coming five years within the company. And we created five versions of the game looking at the five uh, key areas that they work within. So that was like the Chinese market, Japanese market, and so forth. And in this game, what we did was that they were not allowed to play their own company. So they were playing all the competitors. And the key point was to like pressure test their own strategy from a competitive perspective and try to have a good understanding of, of the different opportunities and challenges that would present themselves. And as I mentioned before, when we create games, we create them as a, as a talking piece. So it's a, it's a way of designing uh, important conversations that you want the participant to have and share. And of course, there's a lot of knowledge within the games. But I think that the, the key knowledge within a game session is the knowledge that, that the participants brings to the table and that they're sharing. So we use this kind of games and especially a war, a war game like this as an opportunity for the participants to, to share their experience, to, to give each other advice and so forth along the way. But this was a very successful solution and, and, and later has been used by this company in, in many different kind of aspects along the way. Uh, we also uh, work with uh, in the, the, the service sector, and one of our key clients is ISS, uh, which is one of the biggest employers in the world. Um, and they work with facility management and so forth. And we created a number of, of solutions and games for them. And one of these games is like a strategy game. You can see an example of, of, of people playing. And that's just a game about making, helping people to understand the new strategy and then understand the market approach along the way. And it's very much about understanding how we building the right relationship with clients. It's about understanding different kind of, 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 of client or customer segments. Uh, it's about how to prioritize, but also very much to make sure that that uh, that you're able to deliver uh, what you sell to the clients. And there's like a, a strategic alignment between your capabilities that you build in the organization and what the, what the clients are looking for along the way. And we created different versions of this game. The first version was for the Scandinavian strategy, and now we are creating a later version for the, like the global strategy. And, uh, and you might, to, to put it very, to, to simplify it a little bit, you might say that, that the point of the game is that in the first round of the game, you, do, you can do okay if you follow the old strategy. In the second round, you're gonna, you're gonna fall behind, you're gonna fall back. You're, you're not able to keep up with the competition. If you don't change your strategy. And on the third round of the game, if you stick with the old strategy, you're going to go bankrupt. You're not going to succeed. So, so the, the, the game is a way of, of teaching people why the strategy is working, why it's right, and so forth. So different examples of, of how we make bespoke game solutions to help understand organizations to, to roll out and, and create a, a clear understanding of, of the strategy across you know, big organizations. And then finally, there's like the, the key element of, of, of leading the transformation, which, which in many cases is the most challenging part, the most important part. And I'm very fond of uh, an old quote, I think it's from Hartmut Medorn, who was uh, the former head of Deutsche Bahn, the railroad, uh, national railroad company in Germany. And he, and, and he said that the change management is about changing the management. 
because managers, they are the one that, that uh, defines the culture in big organizations. And if you want to change anything, you have to change them as well. And, uh, and of course, there's the hard approach to fire people and hire a new management group. But also, of course, you can work with people. And, uh, and, and this is the kind of approach that we hope to, to support. So, so we make a lot of solutions, try to help the management group and organizations both to, to handle the transformations, but also to, hand, to handle the new um, leadership roles along the way. And, um, and we have like, as I mentioned earlier, five different kind of leadership simulations that address different, different aspects. So the first is game changers. It's very much about strategy execution, change management, and very much about stakeholder involvement. And you might say that this game is about the politics in big organizations. So, so when you have like a complicated organizations, perhaps a matrix organization or international organization, how, how, how do you make sure there is progress between the strange projects? How do you make sure that the different, different stakeholders in your own organizations and different silos, people below you, above you, that you get the necessary support along the way. This is a, 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 a game that has been used to many, many organizations and, and in a lot of different countries to try to help the key management group to, to and, and change agents to, uh, to facilitate these general change projects. Then there's wall breakers, which is about change management. It's very much about handling resistance. It's about leading a, cha a team in, in a change process. Then you have Playmakers, which is a game regarding team performance. And it's about like a cross pressure of being a team leader, perhaps for a project team, where you both have to, to, to focus on, on, on handling, you know, the rest of the organization, steering committees, uh, end users, and so forth. But also you have to make sure that, that there is a, that you're leading the team, understanding the dynamics, uh, the different persons uh, driving team performance. This is a very nice game to, to, to work with and teach the basics about what leadership is. And, uh, and for instance, it's been used by the, by the healthcare sector in Denmark to, to train doctors in what leadership is. And then the final two games is about timekeepers. It's more, very much about project management. So it's about handling resources. It's about handling risk and so forth. And Screenliners is a game regarding portfolio management. Uh, handling resources across projects and so forth, and very much about having a financial focus. And then I'm just going to have a, a close look at, at two of these solutions. One of them is Game Changers, as I mentioned. And this game, uh, the, when you create a leadership simulation, what we do is that we 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 look at what 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 kind of academic backgrounds, models, and so forth can we use to inspire the game. So in this one, we're looking at like uh, integrating like classical theories regarding. Uh, change management, for instance, John Carter, but also we're looking at theories regarding how to, how to negotiate. So it's also very inspired by Richard Schell from Wolfen. It's inspired by also the, the integrate, like sometimes the Thomas Kilman test regarding con uh, how to handle conflict and so forth. But we try to have like a solid uh, academic background uh, that support the, the, the game mechanics and the different kind of consequences of, of, of the different kind of actions in the game. Uh, but what we normally do is that, that we don't make these theories explicit in the game. So, so depending on the situation and the target group, sometimes you can use uh, the game as an opportunity to train these theories along the way. So many of our games are used in like business schools. So this is where we can also look at the theories. But in other cases, um, normally with like big uh, corporate clients, well, it, it's, it's not the right time to be academics. So, so there it's much more result oriented. And when we work with game changes, either it's used as a part of a leadership training in academies or talent training programs and so forth. And, and when used in that, that capacity, we mainly focus upon yourself as a leader. How can you be better at creating progress with your projects and so forth? How can you be better at, at working with your stakeholders and so forth? And other times we use the, the, this game to support specific change projects. So then it's not about you know leadership training about well, what if um, or, or just in case training, but it's much more about just in time training. And this this tool has been used in many organizations to support very specific change projects along the way. And what we normally do is that after we have played the game with game pieces, then we use some of the game elements, uh, the game board and so forth, but with the real stakeholders, and use the game as an opportunity to make a more solid rollout plan uh, and so forth. 
Yeah, there's, there's, there's just two examples. Uh, the other example I like to share is, uh, is wall breakers, as I mentioned. And, uh, and the metaphor in this game is about how to keep your team on the bus. So in the game, there is a fictional company and you are responsible for a team uh, in organizations that go through a very uh, turbulent change process. And, and in the game, you have an opportunity to work with, uh, one aspect is the, 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 the change speed. So how fast, uh, how high a pace are you gonna set regarding implementing the new change in the organization? And you have to find the right balance regarding everyday operations, delivering results, but also implementing these kind of new structures and tools and so forth. And then depending on the speed, a lot of your colleagues will go into resistance for different reasons. And then again, the, the, the colleagues are represented by game pieces and they fall off the bus and they go into different, different levels of resistance. And then the game is very much about, okay, how can you, by, by picking different kind of leadership actions, how can you help people to get back on the bus along the way? So, so this game is very much about finding out that, that in change situations, where people react differently, we have to understand people not as game pieces, but as individuals along the way. And it's a way of helping people to, to be better at understanding change, but also understanding their team and what they can do to, to, to have people to support the change along the way and to get back on the bus. And, uh, and again, this game is used on a lot of leadership academies to support um, the, 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 the leadership training for individuals. Uh, and right now it's used by one of our clients in China. And uh, I think currently they've been using it with 150 different leaders, uh, Chinese leaders. But also this game is used to support specific change projects. And one of our major clients is uh, a, a company called Ala which is leading within diary in, in Northern Europe. So they produce milk and butter and cheese and so forth. And, they, and every time they, at their big sites, are, are implementing uh, lean processes, they use this game as a, as, a, as a part of the starting up every time to emphasize the cultural aspects of, of, of working with lean along the way. And they are, are been using the game a lot. And I think they have like 20 consultants internally who are certified in using this game with their colleagues. So just to give you some example of the different kind of, 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 uh, of, of leadership tools that we're working with. And, and, and now I've been showing some of the generic leadership tools that I think they, they're available in like seven different languages. But also we have uh, created a lot of like bespoke leadership tools as well for, for, for different kind of clients. So this was just a basic overview of, of our approach, what we've worked with along the way. And um, and as, uh, as you've seen, most of our tools are physical. We do sometimes uh, have a, a blended learning aspect, some, some digital support, but, uh, but I think, as I mentioned before, for us, it's, it's, uh, we see games as, as a way of designing important conversations. And, and, and our games is very much to learn with culture, understanding, insights, and so forth. And our experience and the experience of our clients is that, well, tend to lose something when there's a screen between people. So, 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 so you can't, you can't, uh, you, you're losing something very important if you try to do it all digitally along the way. So, so in that way, we're a little bit old fashioned, you might say. And, 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 but of course, there's a lot of excellent opportunities within digital. So many times you try to make combined solutions where you perhaps have some digital aspects either before or after a session. Uh, where we meet people face to face along the way. So, so this was just a, 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 some some introduction to our approach, some of our solutions. I'm looking forward to to meet you at the conference, but also you can have a a hands-on experience and look at the some of the solutions in real life. You know, you to understand games, you have to play them. It's a little bit um, it's never enough just to 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 show pictures and talk about them. And then I can see Casper asked the questions regarding how we can, can convince executive leadership to use games. And I think that's, um, that's a very good question. I think I, I started to use games in big organizations, I think 17, 18 years ago. And, and when I started out, it was something very exotic. But what I think is amazing that it, it has changed a lot. And right now we're working with a majority of the biggest Danish and also perhaps Scandinavian companies. And within traditionally very conservative sectors within like finance and so forth. And our experience is that right now, 
uh, at least in, in, in Northern Europe, well, everybody understands that, that, that games are, are very valuable tool. And, 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 and we, don't, we don't have to any longer uh, spend time convincing people that, that games are relevant or efficient. Now it's much more about, well, how can we use them this time? So, so we've seen a dramatic change in perspective uh, over the last yeah, 15, 20 years along the way. Then, of course, there is uh, in, in, in some countries and, and in some organizations, well, there is a little bit about wordings along the way. Um, and um, and so, so in, in, in some areas, uh, in some organizations, well, it, it might be a good idea to call it a simulation instead of a game, or perhaps call it a tool along the way. It, it, because there is uh, people, people associate, you know, some kind of words to, to the word play. It's not serious and so forth. So sometimes you might have to adapt the, the wording, but, uh, but we feel that people very much support the solutions. Uh, I'm just looking at some of the questions. Uh, Ask, I just typed one question uh, to maybe have you talk about as you developed as a company these games, what did you learn about developing leadership games that, that make them more effective? That's a good question. I think that, that the key element is to, I think what games can do is it, they can help us to take something that is very complicated and then, and then they can help us like simplify it. And, uh, and I think a very key aspect and very hard part of game design is to find the right level of complexity. It's, it's like to make a map and you have to find like the perfect scale because if, if the scale gets, uh, it's other, you know, you get too high a scale, you, you lose the complexity. It gets too, too simplified. It's, it's getting banal. But, but also you don't want too much complexity. So it's about finding just the right kind of balance to make sure that, that, uh, that you have like a, a, the key essence, but not too much. So many times when we develop games that we make first, uh, we, we very much believe in, in like, uh, you know, rapid prototyping. So we try normally as fast as possible to make like a first version, a sketch version that we can play out. And, 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 and then we, and, and that first version is almost always too complicated. And then we use a lot of the, a lot of the time in developing project to try to, to simplify the solution along the way. And what we try to do is to make a very elegant and easy solution, uh, but that it's still, you know, has like the key and most important uh, dynamics that we want to work with along the way. So, so that's, but that's a, it's a, it's a tough challenge. You have another question here, ask about uh, how you involve clients in the prototype versions. And we try to involve them a lot along the way. And I think in many cases, uh, when, especially when we make like a, a strategy game for a big company, that, that when we when we try to when we make the game we ask a lot of uh, you know uh, probing questions so 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 uh, and in many organizations I think that 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 uh, just being part of the development project is a great help for them to help them to be sharper on the on, on the strategy and create internal alignment along the way so many times it's a very it's a very intensive partnership between us and the clients and try to make you know, the right kind of solutions along the way. Uh, and also with many of our clients that are not used to working with games or developing games, I think it's very hard for them to, to imagine what, what a solution could, could look like or, or what it could do before they try it out. So we try to, to, to prototype as fast as possible and prototype together with the clients along the way. Uh, and then you add what kind of, of of the companies makes the best use of our, of our products. I think that uh, well, we work with a lot of different kind of sectors and clients, and and I think that it's, I think it's important to understand uh, where people are, what kind of change journey are they on, and what do they read now, right, or what do they read use, what do they need right now, and I think that that that. Uh, there is a growing emphasis, in my experience, in big organizations in, 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 in prioritizing working with change, prioritizing leadership development, and so forth. 
uh, being more aware about like these softer aspects of change, being better at change communications, involvement, and so on. And of course, there's difference between, uh, differences within organizations regarding how much you prioritize these elements, and also regarding like a setup, uh, how much you can do. Uh, so yeah, but, but I think we have a we work a lot of different clients. I think normally because our, our tools are very good at addressing very complicated situations. So many of them are focused really in like very complicated organizations, like international metric organizations. But we also work with like smaller clients. And then there's just uh, one aspect I like to 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 add at the end. I think that 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 one experience is that in many organizations today people are are very skilled. They're very good. They're very professional. Um, and, uh, and and when you are within an organization which have a, a self-understanding of we're all very good, you're good, I'm good, and so forth, the whole idea about doing something new where you're not as good at, that's very terrifying. So I think that in many organizations, there's like a, a, people tend to be conservative because they are so good, they are so, uh, so professional, and the whole, and there's a little bit of fear relating to Try something new where, where, where you're going to make a, a fool of yourself, of course, in the first easy steps. And I think what, what a game can do is that it created like a safe sandbox. And, and, and it gives you an opportunity to take some of these important first steps in a new direction uh, in, in a safe environment. So you can, put, you, you, can, you can get rid of some of the pressure in big organizations. You can, you can get rid of some of the fear. And I think that that's a, a key way that our games help our clients along the way, to help them to 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 go in new directions in a safe and, and, and engaging way, take away the fear. Uh, and actually, Casper is, is uh, has asked if we design games for company-wide transformations, and 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 that happened in many cases. Uh, so some games has been for the big companies and big turnarounds, but many are many also for like you know. Big rollouts to, uh, with with the managers, but also with the with the front end employees. And for instance, I mentioned earlier the client Ala within the diary business, and they have uh, had a few years ago a new uh, brand, and very focused within the sustainability called Closer to Nature, and we helped them to develop a game based solution that that could help to to roll out this kind of platform and these messages throughout the international organization. I think it was like 7,000 employees across more than 10 different countries that were using these game-based solutions to, to, to work with local culture. And, and that game was very much about co-creation, very much about knowledge sharing, and how the different people could, um, could, uh, could contribute to the strategy. So, so just to respond to Casper's question, so we develop a lot of games that have been used by you know, thousands of people, uh, other cross organizations, but also within the same organization. All right, I think we're just about time um, is running out. Um, thank you very much, Ask, for your presentation. And as I said, we will make the recording of this session available to everyone. And I hope we will see many of you at our conference in three weeks. Thanks very much for joining us and uh, look forward to other webinars that will be coming along maybe in the fall. Thanks very much for everybody. Looking forward to see you in a few weeks. And, uh, and if you're interested, uh, perhaps go to our website. It's works.dk. There's a short introduction movie to what we do, but also you can find uh, more info regarding our approach, uh, regarding our tools, but also regarding like upcoming uh, certifications, if you like to use these tools in your organizations. And, uh, and we have several times a year, we have certifications either in Copenhagen or in London. I think we also have an upcoming one in November in, uh, in Silicon Valley area. Okay. Thanks everybody.